let's go now to Victoria Gardens Pollinator Corridor. Uh, let me say that you can visit the Pollinator Corridor on Saturday, April the 30th. This terrific urban restoration project was designed and installed by Naomi Vinbury. I'd like to thank Jonathan Reckless of Reckless Videography for making this video for us. So, in honor of her late wife, Victoria, Angela Fitzsimmons asked landscape designer Naomi Vinbury to create a block long pollinator corridor for monarch and swallowtail butterflies. It's called Victoria Gardens. Naomi researched what plants naturally grew in this part of Oakland, and she developed a list of a dozen plants to reintroduce to the neighborhood. Nearly 700 plants were grown out specifically for this urban restoration project, many from seeds and cuttings taken from genetically local native plants. Together, Angela and Naomi knocked on neighbor's doors, requesting permission to plant any part of the neighbor's front gardens. 15 homeowners offered to participate in the project, yielding two by two foot patches around a utility pole in one case, I think this is just so cute, uh, entire parking strips in several others or specific sections of people's front gardens. These tiny sanctuaries offer butterflies, moths, native bees and other insects plants on which they can sip nectar, gather pollen and reproduce. Many butterflies and moths can only breed on specific native plants. The monarch butterflies, I'm sure you know, will only lay eggs on milkweed. Let's go now and meet Naomi Vinbury. So we'll unmute Naomi. So I have to say that this is just one of the most interesting uh, projects that I have seen in the entire 18 years that I have been running the garden tour. I love the community, community component of it. I love the block long ecological restoration component. And um, it's just been such a, a treat for me to uh, get to follow along with this project. So Naomi, is there anything you'd like to say about it before we start the video? Um, well, first of all, thanks for having me, Kathy. And it's great to be here with everyone today. And um, the project was really fun to, um, to coordinate. It's a little windy here. Sorry, maybe being outside was a bad idea. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I'd just like to say that one thing we didn't um, actually have in the video uh, is that the project site is in Oakland. And I'd just like to acknowledge that it's on um, unceded Ohlone territory. Um, and that's just one component that's missing. And I, I think that the participatory aspect of the project is um, really most important besides, I guess, the first, uh, uh, I, I suppose the, the um, one takeaway is like, it's, it's all about nectar for the, the butterflies right now. Um, so you'll see in the, in the video that uh, we're really focusing on, on nectar in the urban areas. Okay, so, yeah. well, let's go look at the video. And then um, if you have viewers questions, you can type them into the chat and Naomi will uh, be with us after the video is over. So my name is Naomi Vinberry and I have never done a project quite like this before. This is the first one of its kind for me. Well, the Butterfly Corridor or what we call the Butterfly Project um, came about about two years ago and um, my friend Angela um, really wanted to do something um, life affirming in a dark time the pandemic had started and um, also she wanted to um, to do a butterfly project that um, that honored her late wife Victoria um, who was an avid gardener and lover of the butterflies and so 
we started talking and we came up with a plan um, to knock on doors all along this block on 63rd Street from Shattuck to Racine and see if homeowners were interested in um, contributing sidewalk strips or front yards to be planted with California native plants in order to support um, specifically the monarch butterfly. We particularly focused on the monarch butterfly this year because the populations um, of the monarch butterfly have declined drastically over the past few decades and even more severely in the past few years. Um, and so we wanted to put in some habitat that was gonna be specifically helpful for their migration routes and their populations. Basically looking at what used to grow here What's our best bet for California native plants that were here before the ecosystem was degraded or destroyed by development? These plants know the soil, they know the climate, and they have a relationship with our native insects and, um, you know, anywhere from beetles to butterflies. So this one here is called gum plant, and it has a really nice big um, open form so that the butterflies when they land they are able to um, sip on a lot of little flowers it's a composite so if you look closely there's actually many little flowers within this one flower and they provide a lot of nectar um, in the spring and summer months for the butterflies when they migrate um, they're overwintering in um, different sites along the coast during the, the wet season, during the winter months. And then as the, um, as the weather changes, as it warms up a little bit, they're gonna start coming out of their hibernation period and, um, and looking for milkweed and looking for nectar along the way. Um, so this one in particular provides a lot of good nectar for them. So all of these patches, there's about 15 of various sizes of sidewalk strip patches and um, front yards along the block. Um, they were all planted last year in January. Um, so this is all one, one year's growth and they've really filled in well. Um, this one here is Verbena lasiostachis and um, it's just thriving. It's really getting its roots down deep. All of them, the grandelias growing up well, and the yarrow here is starting to fill in and make a nice living mulch. And it crawls around by rhizome and creates a nice patch. So here's another patch that we did. We have um, the verbena, lasiostachis. We have grandela camporum. Um, we also have the seaside daisy down here. And this is a patch where I'll show you one thing you can do really easily, especially with stuff coming out into the sidewalk. Clip it down and then you can do your chop and drop right on site to make some more mulch and then you're not having to take any of that debris off the site. This homeowner let us plant here in the front yard a bit too. So just on the edge, you see the yarrow, dried yarrow um, flower heads from last year. We leave those. There's little insects that, um, that utilize it. We have California aster filling in. Here we have some bulbs that we planted. These are Tritilea laxa, it's a native bulb. So we have some poppies, California poppies that we seeded. The verbena, Lasiostachis, in this area has a lot more room, so we're really letting it fill in and bush out a lot more. The plants are kind of growing all intertwining with each other, which is really nice to see because that's what happens in nature. So here we have the coyote mint that's filling in, in between the California aster. And then in front here, we have um, mule's ears. This one is a narrow-leafed mule's ears, or Wyethia angustifolia. 
And we have checker bloom that's really beautiful right now. And in the back of the garden, you see all the dried stalks there. So that's the one milkweed that did really well. <laughs> but this one in particular um, really was strong. And you can see at the base, there's already a lot of new growth coming in. We added a few into this here. This is our cow parsnip. It's a really great um, butterfly nectar plant and also a host for another butterfly that's local, the swallowtail butterfly. So this area is just a really tiny spot, but um, as you can tell, there's a lot that we were able to put into this small space. And even a small space like this can really help the butterflies jump from one patch to another in the corridor. Um, they could nectar here when these flower and then continue on. See in here, the poppies really took off in this area. So we've got a few that are starting to bloom there. So here's a few more plants that we put in, in this little two by two foot spot. And same over here, we have yarrow and we have the Western vervain or verbena. These folks have a beautiful dark star ceanothus that wasn't part of the project, but it's a really great plant for the bees. And then in this area, it's blank right now in the middle. See where the wood chips are? Um, but that's where we have a lot of dormant um, Asclepius fascicularis, which is our native California milkweed. So the Grindelia is really happy here, but you can see there's actually a number of species hidden underneath. We've got the yarrow again coming in. Um, and then the coyote mint, which smells really delicious. And then in the summer, that'll have a purple flower on it. Um, so the idea of this, um, this butterfly corridor also is to have something blooming at all times during the year so that the butterflies have nectar every season, not just in flower season in the spring. So this year we mostly focused on maintenance in this area and then we did do one install on a larger front yard. Uh, we were able to put in a lot of species and we introduced a few other species in this one um, that support some other butterflies. So the swallowtail butterfly that I mentioned, the host plant for that is Yampa. And so we've added that into this garden as well as some more nectar plants. So here we have some mule's ears and we have the Yampa, which is really tiny right now, but that's just getting started. And then some blue-eyed grass. And this is fuchsia here. That's Epilobium canum over here we have the Facelia californica and that large one there that's a uh, media elegans and it has this beautiful little yellow flower with a purple ring in the middle and it's a good nectar source so here's another little spot um, we have blue-eyed grass which is in bloom right now And then these cages are where the um, milkweed are planted. Um, and then this is a bulb, the Tritillia laxa coming up and it's really starting to spread, um, which is nice to see. It was just like one little blade last year when we put it in. And then again, here are the mule's ears along the side. And we've got California aster, coyote mint. And this was the first garden that I started gardening um, or started working for a number of years ago. So a majority of the front yard is native and this is actually going to be on the Bringing Back the Natives garden tour this year. And this sidewalk strip here is a mix of native and um, introduced, but mostly it's native. You're seeing the poppies just really fill in and here we have this great buckwheat 
Um, and then this one is Heterotheca um, sessiliflora. Um, and that one creates a really nice um, landing pad for the butterflies and a lot of nectar for a good part of the year. Some more uh, coyote brush actually that has um, come in from the larger coyote brush here next door. And if you look up close, you can see that there's this great little gall forming and there's um, these little midges that use that as their home and then will emerge. So it's hosting some creatures, which is the goal. And behind you, there's a really beautiful manzanita. It just is finishing flowering. You can see the blossoms drop there underneath it. So that's, that's the corridor. That's the corridor. Right on. The species that we decided on for this project um, were all grown by Oaktown Native Plant Nursery. Um, and the plants were grown from seed collected from, from local um, seed stock. And we tried to, to keep the seed stock as, as local and Bay Area specific as we could. Kristen at Oaktown and her crew, they grew up um, hundreds, almost 700 plants the first year for this project in small stubby tubes. We planted everything out in January and I would say January is really the prime time so that the plants can get established on site with the natural rain as opposed to having to do a lot of hand watering the first year. Um, gives them a better chance of success and um, also decreases water usage. So this year we started doing a little um, section of sidewalk strips in Alameda um, to create a, a corridor of native plants. And what was interesting in Alameda is we actually took a different approach um, because we found a population of um, these trapdoor spiders that were living out there. Um, as you can see here, we used a lot of mulch in order to suppress the weeds and to hold moisture in the soil. In Alameda, because that population of spiders are there, we decided not to mulch at all and we're just hand weeding um, in order to make sure that we don't disrupt the, the trapdoor spiders. They're actually, actually these spiders that tunnel underground and, and require bare soil to create a little trapdoor. Um, then if we mulched over them, that would really destroy their, their habitat. Um, so we've just been doing hand weeding and, and the idea there is to keep um, connecting the dots. So we have two sidewalk strips and we're hoping in the future to continue talking to homeowners to um, continue a little line of, of patches that connect with Jean Sweeney Park which is in the process of being developed as a um, open space park. Um, so that will be a really nice hub of, of um, habitat, hopefully for our, our native creatures in the future. I think these projects can be really beneficial on a larger scale. I think it's important that the design and impl implementation of the project is very community-based, so really participatory in the process of the project and design of the project. So I think information um, being disseminated about uh, the importance of native plants is a really good first step. And then working with neighborhoods to implement some native plantings in the style I think could be really beneficial in the urban setting. That was terrific, Naomi, thank you. So we've had some uh, questions and I have some questions myself. So uh, someone asked about aphids and milkweed. Do you wanna comment upon that? Yeah, I noticed there's often a lot of aphids on the milkweed, um, but I just leave them because they usually don't um, 
take too much from the milkweed and um, the ladybugs like to eat them and they can uh, be a host for uh, a number of different species um, that utilize them as food. So yeah, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Let me say that last year on the virtual tour, we had a presentation by Mei Chen on aphids and milkweed, and it was just fantastic. You can see it on the Bringing Back the Native Garden Tours YouTube channel. And she shows all the different insects that come in because of the aphids. And uh, it was so interesting. At any rate, at the end of the day, she said, just leave them alone. And if you do, ladybugs will come and birds will come. And I've heard people tell me that they actually grow milkweed specifically um, because they do bring in the aphids, which do bring in you know, the ladybugs and birds. A couple of people asked if you watered these yeah. birds. Um, watering is an interesting one, especially with a spring like this where it's been so dry. Um, but last year, uh, it was also pretty dry in the spring. Um, so what we did is a cycle and soak kind of method for watering. Um, and since we planted in January, we really didn't have to water the plants too much. Um, but we did a, uh, I think it was uh, once a month um, watering where we, um, three times in one day or three days in a row, once a month, um, we watered to get to one inch of rainfall for that month if we didn't get any natural rain. Um, if it rained, then we didn't water. Um, but yeah, the the once a month, one inch kind of rule is, um, is pretty good and we had a lot of success with that. Um, one inch of rainfall will soak down six inches into the soil. Um, so it really gets down to the, um, the root system. And luckily this year, um, we already had our, our rainfall in the fall, a number of inches. So the deeper soils were already wet, even though it was pretty dry January through now. Um, yeah. That's very interesting. I've never heard of the three times a day or three days in a row. How do you measure a one inch watering? Like, how do you know if you um, That's a good question. So the, um, the cycle and soak is, is good because um, if the soil gets really dry, what'll happen is it's hydrophobic. So the water will kind of run around and kind of make these little like pathways and then it won't soak in if you're just um, putting all that water in um, right at the same time. So if you kind of slowly do it um, over a number of waterings, um, if you have a drip system, then, you know, it'll go much slower over a longer period of time. But if you're doing it by hand, yeah, I would say space it out a little bit. So it gives it a chance to like really soak in. Um, and then, sorry, what was the other part of your question? How do you know if you put down an inch? Oh, like yeah. Um, like if you drip, you can calculate, but if you're hand watering, do you just guess? Well, so you can do the little, uh, I use cat food cans, but you can use tuna cans or like dolma cans or whatever. Um, and you put those down kind of around the area where you're watering and then put your uh, nozzle onto like a sprayer setting. And as you're watering over an area, then um, time it and you can see when that little can gets to an inch of water, mm -hmm. um, then you know how much time it took on your, your water setting, you know, your pressure mm -hmm. and everything. And then, um, yeah, and then next time you need to water an inch, all you do is get out there and set the timer and go for as long as it took. Mm, that's great, thank you. Um, so let's see, you have 15 houses that participated in the project. If people come to visit um, this block on Saturday, April the 30th, how will they know which homes are participating? Um, so there's gonna be um, a table set up at, um, Ashley Spinelli's house, which is on the tour, um, and there's going to be music next door at Angela's house, um, who's also on the tour. Um, but then there's, uh, so that'll kind of be like a base of information. And then all the little patches around the block will have, um, they'll have labels on river rocks. So as you walk around, there'll be some signage on the little patches um, on 63rd Street. And they're just between Racine and Shattuck. So it's a pretty um, small area. If you walk the block, you'll likely run into them. Okay. What's been the reception of the people who've participated to like having their garden planted and how it looks now and the idea of a, being part of a project like this? 
Um, some people have uh, given more feedback than others and been more involved than others. Some like have come out and actually, you know, done some maintenance weeding and planting with me and others are a little more hands off and just, you know, happy to contribute a little space that's planted with native plants. Um, I think that uh, the participatory aspect of this project was a little bit more challenging because of COVID um, and not, you know, being able to work closely with people. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping, you know, in the next um, few years, there can be more um, collaboration and participation and uh, get people kind of hands in the, in the dirt <laughs> a little more. Um, but yeah, I'd say I'd say it's mixed. Probably 50-50 people that are um, that are getting out and actually, and you know, working on site with me. Do you have any uh, tip or advice for people who might like to do a project like this on their own block? Like, how would they even just get started? Um, I think just getting to getting to know people, so talking to people. And um, I think one thing uh, that this project, one way that this project could have been improved is, um, is having the people who are offering the space on the land where they live um, to be involved in the decision-making process a little bit more. This was kind of a, a first go where I was making a lot of the decisions on species and um, you know install and placement and all of that. And some people prefer that, but um, I would say getting people involved in like actually deciding um, you know, what species are gonna be used, giving more options of, um, of a, a more extensive plant list. We, we dialed it in to like 12 species for simplicity and they were the, the recommended ones by, um, the list actually came from mostly the Xerces Society site for monarchs. Um, and I researched the, um, those species specifically. I looked at some historical records through the Jepson Herbarium, UC Berkeley, um, to verify that they were like historically in that area. But I would say, yeah, just um, getting people, asking people, you know, if they, if they wanna be involved in that decision-making process. Um, and then maybe even asking if people want to contribute because this was totally funded and installed um, free of charge to the, the homeowners, which I think can be a benefit for some and for others, it may create a situation where they uh, may not feel much ownership or or um, value in the project if they're not contributing in some way um, and having that like ownership aspect of of participating. Um, so something to consider. Okay, I had one last question. A couple of people asked, why did you have fencing around the milkweed? Oh yeah, I saw that question. Um, a friend of mine who's a gardener in Alameda had heard from somebody at a, a nursery locally that in the first year you wanna cage the milkweed because what ha often happens is the plants are so small that um, when the butterflies lay, then the caterpillars will munch them right down to the ground and sometimes they won't make it. So if you actually cage them the first year, then the um, butterflies won't lay on them and then they will be able to um, get established a little bit more um, substantially. But on that note, Kathy, um, I have been hearing a lot of debate around whether we should be even planting milkweed here in the East Bay. Um, so that's why I'm saying we, you know, with the Xerces Society, I'm parroting what the Xerces Society is saying, close to the coast, you just want to plant nectar for the butterflies. And we're sort of on that line where we are fairly close to the coast and close to overwintering sites. So, um, really figuring out what the best butterfly nectar plants are for your area and planting those, I think is the best um, thing from what I've understood so far, because otherwise these um, milkweed plants too close to the overwintering sites um, can create a resident population where the genetics aren't, aren't mixing because the butterflies aren't migrating very right. far. So uh, the word seems to be to not plant milkweed if you're within five miles of the coast and then to plant our local species of milkweed if you're five miles or more from the coast. Is that what you're understanding? That's what I've understood from the Xerces Society. 
And mm -hmm. what are our local species of milkweed that people should be planting if they're going to plant it at all? Um, well, the one that's the most widely, uh, the one that has the largest range in California, I suppose, and what we focused on is the Asclepius fascicularis or the narrow leaf milkweed. Um, and I've heard some debate about the showy milkweed, Asclepius speciosa, um, but that's another local species of milkweed. Okay. So um, can you, um, Naomi, stay with us online if there are other questions that can be answered? Yeah. Definitely. All right. So I want to thank you so much for making the video and being with us today and working on that terrific project. It's been just so exciting for me to think about it and to think about the possibilities of doing such a thing, you know, in the future myself, I hope to. Same, thank you so much, Kat. So uh, like me, you may be of an age when you remember your mom or dad warming up the car before they started driving. Did your parents do that? Mine did it all the time. But I learned recently that if your car is idling for more than 30 seconds, it's better to turn the car off and turn it back on again than to leave it running. You can save gas, save money, and spare the air by turning off your car's engine if you'll be waiting more than 30 seconds. You'll be protecting your and your family's lungs, saving money on gas, and as car exhaust is the number one source of air pollution in the Bay Area, you'll be helping to keep our skies blue. If you're waiting to pick someone up from school, sports practice, or the library, if you're sitting at a drive-thru or a car wash, just turn your engine off. You can learn more at idlefreebayarea.org. And now when I do, when I go through a fast food place or if I'm waiting something, I turn my car off all the time. I don't let it idle at all these days. <laughs>